This video gives you a brief introduction to single-cell RNA-seq data analysis. So by watching this video, you will learn the principle of how single-cell RNA-seq works and also what can go wrong in the process, what are UMIs and why do we use them, what are empty doublets and dropouts, why this kind of data is so challenging to analyze, also, what are the main analysis steps uh, for clustering cells and finding cluster market genes? And what is SERA? So, single cell RNA seq is a relatively new technology, and the data analysis methods are still being actively developed. With single cell RNA seq, we can do many things, but we can, for example, detect rare cell populations find cell type specific changes in transcriptome and find uh, development uh, uh, trajectories during development processes and so on. There are many lab technologies for capturing single cell transcriptomes. Uh, some are droplet based, some plate based and some well based. During this course we will be focusing on the 10x chromium uh, data which is droplet based. It's important to remember that when we uh, sequence single cell RNA seq data, we are actually only sequencing the tree prime end, so not the whole whole transcript. We are not going to go into details of what happens in the lab, but this is just a very uh, sort of schematic overview to remind you that. So this is actually from DropSeq, uh, from Carroll's lab, this image. So here you can see that the idea is that we um, try to capture one cell with one barcoded bead in a droplet. And then in this droplet, we lyse the cell, uh, do various uh, reactions, and ultimately we have the messenger RNAs bound to the beads. And once this has happened, uh, we can combine, uh, we, we can lyse the, the droplets and combine the different cells together because now we can always tell them apart because these beads contain these so called cell barcodes, which are unique. So we can tell when we sequence what RNA came from what cell. So here we have a closer look at the, at the bead. So this oligo stuck to the beads uh, consists of, of various things. So the first one is a PCR handle, then we have the cell barcode, and then we have unique molecular identifier or UMI, which helps us to tell apart a PCR duplicate from, uh, from a unique transcript when we are counting the transcripts uh, per gene. So what I didn't say is that this, this process involves uh, various amplification steps and it's important when we do counting that we really count the actual original transcripts only once. Now after the UMI in this oligo there is a long stretch of T's and the idea is that the poly A tail of the mRNA will bind to this. Now on this slide uh, you also have explanation of how the cell barcodes are synthesized and how the UMIs are synthesized. So this information is for DROPSEQ and we are not going to uh, detail in that now. So then when we go and sequence, we actually do pair dense sequencing so that the read 1 covers the cell barcode and the UMI and the read 2 covers the the actual transcript sequence. Then we want to align these reads to the genome so that we can match them to genes and know from which transcript they came from. And then we combine all this information together. So from the genome alignment, we, we get the information which gene or transcript the read is coming from. And on the other hand, uh, the other read we had tells you from which cell this uh, 
read came from. And then ultimately we also have the UMIs here. So the UMIs will help us to solve situations like this. So here, for example, we have two reads uh, mapping to, to ACTB gene. And now we need to know, do they come, were there two transcripts for this gene or only one? And as we can see, the UMI is the same. So that means that these two reads came from the same transcript molecule. So hence we need to count this only once, not twice. Whereas down here we have another example for ARL1 gene. And here the UMIs are different. So we know that these two reads came from two separate transcript molecules. So here we will mark two counts two reads for this particular gene. So we count the UMIs and end up with this, uh, what is called digital gene expression matrix, where we have the cells as columns and genes as rows. And then the numbers indicate how many UMIs for each gene in each cell we detected. So often you get this matrix ready-made for you, but it's still good to understand what happens behind the scenes. So the, when the reads come from the sequencer, you get a fast queue file. Uh, so one checks the quality of the reads. If there is a problem, you can uh, trim or filter the reads. Then you align them to the reference genome. Uh, match the alignment positions to the known locations of genes, so you can put the identity uh, on the reads. Then you do the counting and store the results in this matrix that we just looked at. It's also good to be aware that sometimes things don't go perfectly. So uh, ideally, we want to have one healthy cell in a droplet. But sometimes it can happen that there's actually no cell, just some RNA that was floating around. So we would still get some reads, but uh, those reads wouldn't represent many genes. So the number of genes uh, detected would be very low. And hence we can decide that that was not a real cell, but the so-called empty. And we want to remove these empties. It can also happen that in a droplet we actually get two cells or even more cells. And the way to detect these doublets or multiplets is again the number of genes expressed. So if it's very large, much larger than the, the average number of genes expressed uh, per cell, then we can guess that it's a doublet and we will remove it. Finally, it can happen that the cell that landed in the droplet is broken or even dead. The way to detect this is that we check the percentage of mitochondrial transcripts. If it's high, it is very likely that uh, the cell was not happy. So if the cell is broken, the normal RNA can be degraded, but the mitochondrial mitochondria resist better, so the mitochondrial transcripts survive, and hence we see high percentage of those in our transcripts. Uh, in the case of dropsic, there can be also uh, synthesis errors in those barcodes, uh, but those we can detect and fix to a certain extent. So why is this kind of data then challenging to analyze? Well, first of all, there is a very high number of dropouts. And with a dropout, we mean a gene that is expressed, but we don't manage to detect the expression due to technical limitations. So we just uh, end up having zero in our UMI count table. So single cell RNA-seq data is uh, zero inflated, as people say. The data is also very noisy, so there is high level of variation due to various things. So for example, the capture uh, to the beads uh, varies. So the percentage of mRNA is captured, then the reverse transcription varies. There can be amplification biases, so amplification 
of different transcripts is not uniform. Also, the cell size and cell cycle stage can affect the results. And finally, there can be very big differences in sequencing depth, which means the number of UMIs per cell. So, of course, if one cell has twice as many UMIs in total than another cell, it's very likely that then the UMIs per certain genes are also twice as high. So we need to correct for this kind of things during normalization. Uh, so then, as there is this heterogeneity and also the abundance of zeros, the distribution of expression values we get are very complex. We don't get nice normal distributions, but typically this kind of multimodal distributions. And because of these things, the analysis methods for normal RNA-seq data uh, don't work for single RNA-seq. Now, the most common thing that people want to do is, is to cluster cells uh, based on cell types and then find cluster market genes. So, uh, when you are given this digital expression matrix, uh, the first thing would to, to do would be to check the quality of cells. So you can check what I mentioned earlier for those empties and doublets and mitochondrial transcript percentages. You can do those checks to see if you have empties and, and those problems. If you do, you can filter out the low quality cells. You can also filter out genes at this point. So if you have a gene that is expressed in, in only one cell among your thousands of cells, it might not be uh, that interesting and you can leave it out from your matrix. Uh, then we move on to normalizing the expression values. And the next step is to identify highly variable genes. So, because the genes, uh, the, the cells are clustered based on the gene expression profiles, we are not interested in genes which, which don't show any difference in expression. But we rather need to focus on highly variable genes. And it is these genes that we then use uh, for principal component analysis or PCA. But before that, we need to scale the data so that the highly expressed genes wouldn't dominate. And at this point, we can also regress out unwanted sources of variation, which can be technical or even biological, like a cell cycle stage. Once we have the principal components, we need to figure out which ones of them are significant. And then we use the significant ones uh, to cluster the cells uh, using this graph-based clustering method. Once we have the clusters, we can visualize them using a nonlinear dimensional reduction, such as DSNI or UMAP. So here you have a UMAP picture where the cells, which are the dots, are colored according to the cluster they belong to. And then finally, you can detect and visualize market genes for these clusters. The other topic that we will be covering uh, during this course is integrative analysis, where we compare two samples, so for example, control samples and stimulated samples of cells. But we will talk more about that later. Now, in Chipster, we, many of the tools we will use are based on the Serra package. So, Serra is one of the most popular R packages for single-cell RNA-seq data analysis, uh, because it actually provides lots of tools for all the steps I mentioned in the previous slide, and also for the integrative analysis of several samples. When you are using uh, Serra, uh, it actually stores the information in a SERA object, so it's an R object, which is just a specific data structure that has uh, lots of different slots for, for 
different types of data. So there is a slot for counts, slot for PCA results, slot for clustering results, and so on and so on. Uh, we will also be mentioning another uh, our package, our bioconductor package called Skater. Skater is particularly good for quality control. And Skater has a slightly different object structure, but you don't need to worry about that in Chipster because Chipster can do the conversion. 